Hi class. Uh, we're going to talk about um, unclean, uh, but we're going to talk about chapters 3 and 4. Um, chapter 3 deals with uh, metaphor uh, and how powerful metaphors are for humans. Uh, it helps us take our abstract ideas and make them concrete. We do this all the time in theology. We say the Trinity, oh, I don't know how to understand that. But if I say, oh, well, it's like water, H2O can be a gas, it can be a liquid, it can be a solid. Ah, three things, same substance, maybe that helps. Or like some people say it's like an egg with the shell and then the yolk and the three components, but all one egg. We attach beliefs to metaphor, especially abstract ones, to help us understand them well and to connect to them, right? Like you teach fractions, ah, oh, bring in a pizza. Cut it into eighths, one eighth, two eighths, right? It helps. So this is partly how our brains are structured. We want a metaphor. We want a story. We want something that helps us remember, helps us to uh, um, pass that information along to others. And a series of data is a lot harder to remember than a story or a metaphor. Um, and so he uh, mentions, Dr. Beck, that purity metaphors uh, are... Uh, stick with humans because they evoke our emotions. Uh, they talk, it's like elevation versus degradation. Uh, we become very interested in them. And so because they are related to core emotions like disgust, um, like joy or pleasure, uh, these, this notion of purity, uh, of judgment, of one up versus one down, uh, of clean versus unclean, because that's so visceral, those kinds of metaphors are powerful and they really stay with us. And so we see them in lots of different religions, but in particular Christianity, I've mentioned about Judaism, clean versus unclean, uh, pervades the Old Testament, animal sacrifice as a way of uh, repenting and then becoming clean again, right, receiving that forgiveness. He mentions baptism, the, the, the primary, you know, sacrament, baptism, how I enter the kingdom of God, how I become a citizen, right? I'm, I'm, I'm dead. I drowned in the waters. I'm a new creation. This is about water. This is about washing. This is about purifying, getting rid of my sin, giving my whole self to God, right? So this purification sacrament uh, is, is pervasive within Christianity. And these aren't necessarily bad, of course, right? Purity metaphors are important, but um, there are a lot more metaphors we might want to use to create a robust Christian narrative or set of narratives. So I really loved on page 34 and 35 of the text, uh, there's like this column, um, I don't know if you can see that, that gives you a list of metaphors, right? So certainly the metaphor could be purity, and then sin means dirt or contamination, salvation means clean, being washed, made, made pure. But another metaphor might be God as rescuer. I'm, I'm perishing, drowning in sin, dying to sin. God saves me, so it's perishing versus saved. Or you could have an economic model where sin and being, moving away from God is debt uh, and salvation is repayment. Or a legal metaphor, crime, punishment, forgiveness, justification, right? Or you might think of a metaphor like freedom. I'm slave to sin and Christ sets me free. Or uh, I'm trapped in darkness and I need the light. Uh, like, God, I was lost, but now I'm found, right? I was an enemy, but now I'm a friend. I was an orphan, but now I'm adopted. There are so many metaphors, and but so much of Christianity focuses on purity. And I've already talked about individually this is problematic because then I start focusing on contamination, my own sin, the sin of others, uh, and it can be really problematic. So I don't want to get rid of purity as a metaphor, but what if we thought about sinful people not just as impure, evil, or wicked, what if we thought about them as broken, limited, finite, lost, sick, enslaved? I have a lot more compassion for people when I see them as broken, like I had, a, I had a troubled relationship with my dad. I, you know, we tried to repair it, but it was hard. It, he, that was a hard relationship for me. And when I saw him as like, he's so selfish, 
He only thinks about himself. Why, why, does, why can't he love me well? I was filled with bitterness, and it was very difficult. But when I began to see that my dad was broken, that he was trying but just was not able to love well, his own upbringing was troubled, I had a lot more compassion for him. I saw him as lost and needing to be found, needing to find God, needing to find grace. And so the, as I changed the metaphor for my father, my compassion grew. Um, my acceptance of him grew. He wasn't the father I wanted, and he wasn't the father I sometimes needed, but he was what I had, and there needed to be grace there, right? And I was the only son he had, and I might not have been exactly what he wanted, but I think that was helpful to me to see him as limited, broken, um, and in the dark or lost than as evil or just selfish or something. So the metaphors we use can be helpful, and I'm trying to use those metaphors more and more in my life for my wife, for my kids, for myself. Man, if I, if, like I would never intentionally hurt my kids, but I know that I do. So I'm not intending to, but I am broken. And I am fallible, and I am, I'm often lost. I see only in part. I don't have the skills needed to be the father that they need sometimes. How, what, grace, right? Grace. But if I'm just a bad dad, I'm just a selfish person, I just can't get it right, then uh, I have a lot more judgment. So purity is not bad as a metaphor. It's limiting, and I think it can be harmful, right? He mentioned some of the studies that if you have someone wash their hands before they do a moral evaluation, they're more harsh in their evaluation than if you don't have someone wash their hands. Uh, if, if someone uses a sanitary wipe uh, after uh, a series of studies, they're less likely to help someone else afterward. Um, like 30% less likely to help. And the idea is now that I'm clean, helping someone makes me feel like I'm going to get dirty again, right? I just got clean. I don't want to now get contaminated. So that metaphor so dominates us that it can be a hindrance. As holiness people, right, I'm part of the Nazarene tradition, right, or if you're Methodist or Anglican, you're part of that Wesleyan holiness movement. This can be a troubling thing. Holiness can be about purity. Holiness can be about how do I like, ooh, I don't want to like smoke or chew or run with girls that do, right? Or I don't want to go to an R-rated movie or wear jewelry or play cards or drink alcohol or like I'm not going to do anything that's wrong because I'll be contaminated and I need to be pure. And while that's a great ethic in some respects, right, it sets Nazarenes apart. It says, like, we believe in certain things and practices and an identity. It means that we can be judgmental to non-Nazarenes, right? We can become very judgmental because holiness for us is don't do anything wrong. But it seems to me that holiness is not really about purity, like don't do anything wrong, but rather holiness is about how I love, how I engage, right? Uh, that I have a heart that wants to extend to others. And so we're holy, we're made holy and pure by the way in which we love, not by all the things we avoid. Now certainly we have to avoid certain things, right? Certainly. But I don't want holiness to be exclusively about what we are against. If you ask non-Christians about what Christians believe, it's like they're against homosexuality, they're against drinking, they're against, right, X, Y, or Z, they're against abortion, they're against... Well, what are Christians for? What are we about? We've, we've let purity as don't do X, Y, or Z dominate, that that's what, that's the message that non-Christians hear from us too often. So we have to complement purity with other metaphors that I think might elevate our compassion and help us to engage uh, non-Christians much better, the world much better, and in fact, each other at church better. Um, so he talked about in chapter 3 how purity can heart ourselves as individuals and our psychology and the way we think about ourselves. I have a lot of negative self-talk about um, that I'm not pure. When I, I'm competing with other people, I'm comparing myself. Am I one up to that person? I do less bad things, right? Or am I one down to that person? Are they better? Are they more Christian? But that's not helpful. We're just different. We're people with our own relationships with God and things, but I, I allow that to kind of engage in, in how I think about myself and how I talk to myself, which can often be destructive. So again, maybe we can replace that. I, I'm in bondage to sin and God needs to set me free. That, that helps me much more um, than some others. 
In chapter 4, though, Beck says, but it also hurts our communities. And I mentioned this in, our, in the previous lecture that we isolate certain sins, certain groups. Uh, we divide up that way, and we think of ourselves as pure, more holy, better than. And that judgment can be divisive, right? And so we want to be careful about how we engage one another and how purity metaphors can be problematic. One of the things he mentioned, and I'm going to close the lecture here, was a penal substitutionary atonement. So um, the view is essentially that God is holy, and God cannot have a relationship with sin, because God is holy. I, as a human, am a sinner, so God can't be in relationship with me. The punishment for my sin is death. This is what I deserve. This is like a crime and punishment metaphor. I've sinned. I deserve death. But God wants to have a relationship with me, can't have a relationship because God is holy and I am sinful. And so Jesus uh, becomes the substitutionary sacrifice. So all the things that we deserve, all the punishment I deserve for my sin, gets lumped onto Jesus. He is the substitution. Now I am made pure by Christ's blood. I am now holy and pure and can have that relationship with God. Christ's blood sort of bridges the gap, right, between God and I. And now we can have a proper relationship and forgiveness. And that's true for all humans, not just for me. So there's a there's kind of a sin and punishment and, and legal uh, metaphor. And then there's also this sort of purifying, uh, I'm made clean by Christ's sacrifice metaphor. And those together sort of make up the penal substitutionary atonement. Now, of course, it's not the only metaphor the Bible uses for atonement. Historically, the church, early church, never settled on one view of atonement. There is no orthodox view of atonement. I want to repeat this. There's no one orthodox view of atonement. Christians can differ about atonement and what role Christ plays and Christ's blood and my salvation. We can disagree and still be Christians because this was never set in stone by the church, right? Uh, so if you're a penal substitutionary person, that's great. I don't subscribe to that view of atonement, uh, but that's okay for us to disagree because, there, again, there isn't one orthodox view. Um, penal substitution, I think, has a lot of power. There are scriptures that support it, and I think it, it's powerful because we can remember it. I think we want people who commit crimes and things to pay. We care about justice. Deeply, we have emotions that connected our elephant cares. If you've ever listened to like a Dateline or these murder mysteries, like I want the person to get caught. They've got to be punished. We need justice for the victim, right? We deeply want, not just rationally, but emotionally, we want justice. And so we have sinned and sin demands punishment, right? At the same time, we recognize we can't pay for our own sins. And so we have this deliverance, this salvation from Christ and the purity that comes from his sacrifice. I think that's a powerful set of metaphors. Um, and I don't want to get rid of it. Uh, I think that the church needs to preserve this. I'd like to bolster it with other metaphors, again, about slavery, about death and resurrection, about freedom, uh, about brokenness to wholeness, sickness to health, God as a physician, uh, not just the judge. Like, I want to have God uh, and these metaphors all involved in church. God is not just the judge. He is also merciful. He's also the great physician. He's also the great liberator. All of this stuff is true about God, in part. The penal substitution view is troubling for me in, in several ways. Um, one is that I don't think God is up there counting the cost, like tallying up all my mistakes. I think a lot of human behavior is not because I just like make bad decisions, but it's because I'm a broken animal with desires and fears and instincts. And I think God looks at me with eyes of compassion most of the time. Like, oh, Joe, you know, if you only knew what would lead to life, if you only knew what would lead to connecting with me and with others, you wouldn't do this. But you're lost, right? And this is what Jesus says from the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He doesn't say they're wicked, they're evil kill them or something. He says, look, they're lost. They don't know. Earlier, when he looks over at Jerusalem, he says, oh, Jerusalem, if you would only know what would bring you salvation, right? I think God looks at us that way, not as a judge, like you, 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 have, you need to repay this and repay this, and here's the justice, right? 
but that God sees us a little bit differently than that, at least most of the time, with eyes of compassion. It also seems strange to me that the only way God can forgive me, the only way I can receive forgiveness from God is through Jesus' blood. See, I can forgive people in all kinds of ways, and I don't need there to be blood for me to forgive other people. God is certainly much more flexible, powerful, infinite, transcendent than I am. To say that God can only forgive when there is blood, either from an animal sacrifice or Jesus, makes God very limited, very finite. God is in this box where God can't forgive without blood. It seems to me that, that that's not true, that God can forgive in any number of ways. Through Christ's blood may be one of them, right? Um, but I wouldn't want to limit God that way, that God can't relate to humans without Christ's blood as an intermediary. That, to me, makes God a very limited God, um, and that is troubling. The penal substitution view seems to suggest that God demands that Christ die, uh, which would mean God wills sin, right? The death of Jesus seems to be sin. It's, Jesus is innocent. He does not deserve to be killed. The crowd is screaming, crucify him. The crowd seems to be screaming for something that is unjust, that is sinful. I can't imagine the crowd chanting the will of God there. They seem bloodthirsty, angry, deceived. Um, so to me, God forcing Jesus onto the cross seems to um, say something very negative about God as a father, um, that God could actually will and want something sinful. Uh, to me, it makes more sense to think of God taking on a human form and then accepting the cross, willingly going to the cross. God the Father up here, Jesus down here, God saying, you must. That feels a little bit different than God taking on human form and then going to the cross as a sacrifice. So the metaphors we use here, I think, are important. Um, what are we saying about God, about God's character, about sin, uh, about purity? I don't want to do away with substitutionary atonement. Um, uh, even if I don't subscribe to it all the way, I think it needs to be one metaphor amongst others that would provide a robust view, and it would allow many different people in our pews, many parishioners, right, to connect. Someone might not connect with crime and punishment and getting what you deserve, but they might connect with sickness, healing, and the great physician. Well then I think we need to talk about salvation and atonement as healing. Ex-prisoners might resonate deeply with chained to sin, a slave to my own desires, and God sets me free, provides new desires, a, a new way of living. Maybe that's a way to think about atonement that would resonate with other folks. So let's bolster right, our metaphors and get out of just the purity game. I hope this helps and uh, is interesting to you. If you have any questions at all, let me know, and I look forward to seeing you online.